Hello and welcome to Oink Time. I'm Jen Carnavali. I'm Ben Elwood. And this is our podcast where we chat to awesome and interesting people about a word that we pull out of a hat. If you like the podcast... Please follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Ben doesn't know the link. The I, Twitter I, link <laughs> is... Ben doesn't know it. Is you don't know it either. At Oink Time Pod. Oh, okay. At Oink Time Pod, please. And go to the Facebook page. <laughs> we need more fans. Oinkers, unite. Ben and I have a live show coming up uh, at the Comedy Lounge in Surrey Hills in Sydney. It's on the 4th of November. We have one guest locked in. He's awesome. Should we just say who it is, Benny? Yeah, it's Dan Rath. It's Dan Rath. Yeah. And we're going to have another guest and it's going to be be great. Sean's going to be there. We're going to be there. Um, you should come. We don't have a link for the tickets yet, but we will so soon. Uh, the Comedy Lounge, shit, the Cafe Lounge in Surrey Hills, the 4th of November. If you could do a better fucking job, Ben, you should have done I'll it. I'll do it on my fucking iPhone Go. and just mail it to Sean. Go. All right. That, that was fine. Was it? Oh, shit. Did you have that sock on the entire time? Yes. I forgot to take it off. Oh, shit. Nah, it's all right. No, it's fine. Will it's it good. be okay? Yeah, yeah, it'll be, it'll be fine. I fucking hope so. Edit. And guys, if you like the podcast, give it five stars on iTunes. It helps us get the word out to all the little piggies out there. We need to thank our wonderful producer, Sean Allen, his podcast, In Brackets, with Sean Allen. Check it out. And, of course, our wonderful sponsors, Young Henry's Brewery. Go and drink their beer. And today's guest is the fabulous Karen Martin-Stone, comedian and archaeologist and today we're talking about history dig it look at the pubic bone turn back to just like a bird look at the vertebrae air sacs and hollows just like a bird history look at the pubic bone turn back to just like a bird look at the vertebrae air sacs and hollows just like a bird look at the pubic bone Turn back to it just like a bird. Test. Look at the vertebrae, air sacs and hollows, just like a bird. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. Um, uh, is that how you describe me to people that you that don't know me? <laughs> yeah, ben is a very paranoid man. Is that inaccurate in any way? <laughs> like being honest. I'm not paranoid, I'm hyper anxious. Which I guess is a form of paranoia, we can, isn't it? We can agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny that you say you've heard me on Justin's podcast. Yeah. I, uh, I went on a date recently. Okay. And uh, I didn't Hello. know anything about this person. Yeah. But it turned out they'd listened to all 25 <gasps> oh, episodes oh, of Oink no. Time. Oh, no. Yeah. That's creepy. It it's is fucking creepy, creepy right? Yeah. It is creepy. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm on Tinder these days and as soon as – and my – my name KC comes across from Facebook yeah. and um, some of them, the first question, I've got lots of conversation starters on my profile, but there's like, oh, what's your real name? Mm. Like it's some sort of stripper thing. If they know my real name, they're closer to me. <laughs> and, uh, it's so bad. But then if I say my name's Karen and I'm an archaeologist, Google that and you know me. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so I don't want to just stick it right out there. But yeah, I was when I was on um, uh, OK Cupid for a while. Yeah, I did this thing where I would put photos of myself on stage. It's such a it's such a mercenary thing. Like, yeah. look at me, I'm a big fucking man. Like, I'm standing on the stage at the Enmore Theatre. I have but, a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm important. I'm just not an average guy. You don't have a microphone. <laughs> but it would inevitably lead to people going yeah. on, like you know, doing that kind of Google stalking thing, yeah. which puts you at this weird disadvantage where they it kind does. of know. Who you are, and especially on this podcast, they're listening to yeah. F, like me bleeding all over the place. Yeah, yeah, Ben and I were talking about this because um, I did a gig with past Oinka, um, Tom Walker, mm-hmm. and we were talking about anxiety. And I was like, "Yeah, it's really weird. People I don't know that well are starting to talk to me about my anxiety." And he's oh, like, wow. "Jen, you talk about it all the time on the podcast, so they do know about it." And I was like, "Oh shit, yeah, <laughs> yeah." And then yeah, you just it would just feel so weird that they know personal stuff about you, and they yeah, yeah, they yeah, do, yeah. but then they don't. Like, I mean, they yeah. know some personal things, but at the same time, they know nothing. Yeah. But it's also that thing of you like, know what I mean? Well, like, it's it's yeah. also that thing of like, how are you even going to tell someone an original story that they, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It's like the whole getting to know someone is the unfolding and this story and that story. But, you know, you just naturally tell all your stories on the pod. Yeah. And so all of a sudden they're sitting, like I was sitting with this chick and I started telling a story and she's like, oh yeah, I heard that on the podcast. <laughs> what the f- <laughs> That's gross in a couple of ways. That's gross from both of you because it's gross from her because you know that she's stalked you and listened to every episode, but it's gross from you because it's like, 
Oh, I'm pulling out my funny stories. Oh, fuck <laughs> off. I'm trying to impress this woman That's and so she knows. True. Everyone's Cross that cat. out. All right, talk about the pee story. <laughs> well, did I tell you about this? <laughs> did I tell you about you. the time I shat myself in public? <laughs> it was really funny. Be impressed. <laughs> I've you got a microphone. The, the worst is when they find out you're a comedian, they're like, oh, uh, tell me a funny story. Uh, yeah, or yeah, tell yeah, me a joke yeah. now. And I'm just like, oh, you know, can't we just get to know each other? And then they're like, oh, so, so do you go on stage here much? And I tell them when I'm going to be on. And they're like, will you make Jokes about me? Uh, no. And I'm like, no, no, yeah, this boy. isn't about you. Never. <laughs> you know? Fuck no, that that's better than them, you know, regurgitating some joke they read in Zoo magazine, oh, and they go, oh, you can well. use that if you like. Oh, but then the others, some guys, and I don't know, is it just for female comedians? They get really competitive. Oh, you're a comedian. I'm funny too, uh, and they try and tell yeah, me. Yeah, gross guys do. Yeah. Yeah. Pen dick men do. Yeah. yeah. I um, <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago, there was a guy that I liked when I was really young, and I uh, was like a shell of a human, so I. Ended as opposed idea. to now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm whole. No, um, but he was, like, attractive, so I was like, oh, this could be good. Mm. And a friend of mine uh, and I ran a comedy room, and he was a musician, and I was like, you know, and it was like a, an experimental room, where, which sounds so wanky. People could do whatever they wanted, basically. Yeah. And I was like, you guys should do music, you know. And his friend was also seeing my friend, so it yeah. was like, you know. And we told them about it, and we were like, yeah, you guys can do some music on this night if you want. And then all of a sudden they were like, oh, we want to do comedy. Oh, yeah, no, no, we, we're we funny too. Like, we do funny stuff too. Oh. And you could feel the anxiety because they were like, no, we can't we can't fool around with chicks if we're not. No, we're funny. And I was like, oh, you're oh. not fucking fu- Like, I'm friends with funny men. You're not. You're attractive and you can play a drum. Fucking, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Stick play you're good at. Play that skill. Like, yeah. use that, you know, you know. But they were like, no, no, we can be funny. And, of course, they weren't. It was horrible. And yeah. it made them very unattractive to me. But So I, I know that you're an archaeologist. You and yes. I met. In 2014, yep. we've only ever spoken once before this, not on Twitter, but yeah. once in person, and the conversation still sticks. No, it really does. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Because, Jen, uh, Karen was telling me many years ago, we were talking about, uh, you were talking about how radioactive waste is mm-hmm. a giant problem for obvious reasons, but beyond that, you know, thousands of years from now when you talk about symbols and oh, you know, yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. We were talking about this. Yeah. How like to how, tell people How do you tell someone 10,000? dangerous. Yeah, there's yeah. this amazing uh, Vox video about this. where they, You sent me I the sent link. this to you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they talk about how, you know, uh, 500 years ago the skull and crossbones was the most terrifying symbol you could ever imagine. It was a symbol of poison. Well, even disease. when we were growing up it was still a symbol of um Poison, yeah, like of, of you know danger. Whereas now for kids, it's like, oh, you're cool. You're totally, totally. Yeah. So, so you know, if you were labeling radioactive waste with a skull and crossbones, you know, people could potentially think, oh, treasure, and yeah. dig it up and die of fucking lymphomic cancer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but so this is the thing because radioactive waste takes two hundred thousand years to break down. Mm. So from now, two hundred thousand years into the future, how will we communicate with the people that are living then? Will there be any people living? Well, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> If we're going the way we are. Is that your but, professional opinion? Well, 200,000 years ago, modern humans didn't exist. They were just evolving. Right. So we've come a fairly long way yeah. over those 200,000 years and there's no way to predict what we're going, what the world will be like in 200,000 years except for fucking hot. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's but, exciting. It's super exciting. I think it's exciting. Ben laughs because he's obsessed with the apocalypse. Yeah. But I think it's exciting to see how... How is it exciting? I think it's a fascinating It's thought. interesting to see how, where it's going to go. Yeah, a thought experiment. Like, to think that um, we are absolutely making decisions now that will affect people 200,000 years into the future. Yeah. And we have a responsibility to communicate to them that that's what we've done. And, I mean, that's probably the least of what we've done. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what, it's exciting. But yeah. So has, have, has, has a solution been come up with? Uh, well, there are archaeologists working on it. So they're future archaeologists, not past archaeologists. So oh, what is, what, how, how do you become a future archaeologist? Oh, you just decide to. It's like how do you become a comedian? Yeah, yeah no, no. But what, but what does that entail? <laughs> um, it entails just asking a question of um, what will the culture be like at that time and how do we um, manage our culture now to communicate? And so like you then theorising all these yeah, things. It's all very theoretical and so they have to understand how communications work and how symbols work and how um, cultures read them. And you can also think about how we sent gold records up into space with Aboriginal music on. I mean, who the fuck's ever going to... I was about to say, I listened to a podcast that was about how to communicate and the, um, the debates that are going on, yeah, with aliens and what you should send and what you shouldn't and what would make sense and what wouldn't and what symbols and... All that kind of stuff. I thought it was really fun. Yeah, and so I think that as a base assumption, you can assume you can assume that no one is ever going to know what our 
current culture is or means, what right. our what our writing is, what our language is, what our priorities are, aside from the physical record we leave in the ground. And so I don't think there are any easy answers, but people like to come up with scenarios of, right. well, well, we'll establish this, um, you know, um, impenetrable bunker for the underground disposal of radioactive waste and we'll plaster these symbols on it and we'll um, put a management plan in place where everyone has to um, yeah. train the people that come after them. But how long will that last? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, what, one of the philosophical um, ideas I heard was that they talked about a nuclear priesthood where, well, because they talk about, you know, the only thing that really has survived, you know, even 5,000 years is religion. Yeah. And so you create a religion around this where you create these monks that basically pass it down intergenerationally yeah. saying, like, the legends of this area, like, stay away, stay away. But, again, it's like how do you even, you know. It loses meaning. So I'm sure at some point there were very good reasons for um, some things that became religious text and indoctrination but once the origin is lost it just becomes a faith-based thing mm. and then you will always have people that doubt the faith or um or choose another faith mm. and so or interpret it the exactly. wrong way yeah it's difficult to doubt the faith when you go near a glowing green rock and you grow another head. Like that's that's pretty yeah, stark but that's evidence. that immediate. It's not that yeah, immediate. That's... Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> you know. So I, I go out um, to parts of the Northern Territory that um, Indigenous people have stories about this as being sickness country, for example, and that's where uranium is found. And oh, cool. so yeah, it's they didn't have the science of. Um, radioactivity in their cultural knowledge, but they knew that it was a bad place. Right. So you'd get sick and something horrible would happen if you went around there. Well, yeah, and the other thing too is that um, Aboriginal, um, it's not my place to describe Aboriginal culture, it's not my culture, so I feel like I will need to tread carefully here. But they, um, in many Indigenous cultures in, the, in Australia, they have landscape stories and dreamtime religious beliefs that are associated with features of the landscape. Mm. And I went to Jordan in 2013 and I saw um, the Dead Sea and the Pillar of Salt that was Lot's wife as they fled um, Sodom Sorry, and Gomorrah yeah. and all of that. And my mum went, oh, when you saw that Pillar of Salt, did that convince you that Christianity is the one true religion? <clears throat> and I said, no, it actually reminded me a lot of Indigenous religions and mm. That yeah. phrase, Indigenous religions, kind of blew her mind. But, um, yeah, it was a landscape feature that they made a story about that had a moral to the story and that was designed to influence the behaviour of the people in the culture at that time. A lesson. Yeah, and I went to the cave where Lot abused his children um, and it's become this whole Christian story. And Why is that a site of pilgrimage, a place where a guy abused his children? Well, it's... Mm, it's just a holy I, site, isn't it? It's I, just, wouldn't, yeah, but why, I wouldn't why, say why? it's a holy site or a site of pilgrimage. It is uh, 50 metres away from the mu museum at the lowest place on earth. So it is the... Um, it's below sea level mm -hmm. and on the edge of the Dead Sea and there is now a museum built by the Jordanian government and you can wander up the hill to the cave and it's it's blocked off right. um, and there are signs there. So, yeah, some people do go, oh, this is where Lot took his daughters. Um, and Ew. I just look, it's so creepy. Yeah. I just look at it and go, oh, my God, those poor girls in that dark hole um, yeah. with a... Yeah. I think people just interpret anything like that as evidence to their faith. Yes, yeah, definitely. You know, so yeah, it's, yeah. I think that's why it's like people are checking it out. They don't really care what happened there. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it becomes a bit like that ticker box tourism. You see people getting off buses, like, ah, oh, take a photo, get yeah. back on. Yes, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I yeah. saw it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that no, no. For four seconds. I, I really struggle with that kind of tourism. There were a lot of biblical tourists in the region at the time, um, but I also struggle with war tourism. Um, oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, what's the word they use when it's like people are travelling to see? People went to Detroit after it went bankrupt to see. What do they call it? Like, dark tourism. Yeah, 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 dark, dark tourism. tourism. There's another yeah. word where it's just like, you know, anyway. Yeah, no, but I, when I was married... I don't want to dwell on this for the podcast, but... Um, no, talk about whatever you want. My ex-husband was military, which right. is a bit of a shock. You couldn't imagine me as an army I was going to say, but... wouldn't pick it. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm being honest, I've known you for about four minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> probably wouldn't pick it. He was an archaeologist when I met him, so oh, I cool. kind of like... I, he, he sprung it on me later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sneaky. Yeah, but he always wanted to go to Vietnam, and his dad had been in Vietnam, and I was like, I am not going to Vietnam with you, um, yeah. because it would be weeks of 
military tourism, which is not my thing at all. Nah. Is there is there a part of what you do that does have kind of a ghoulish aspect to it? Oh, yeah. I deal with dead bodies all the time. Really? Yeah. In what respect? Um, I record and conserve human remains. Wow. Yeah. What, like at a body farm? No, like um, where human remains exist in burial grounds or other things. Um, so, again, not my story to tell, but Indigenous burial practices in Western Arnhem Land and other parts of the top end was a two-stage burial practice. The first stage was uh, the body was exposed on a platform for a year and natural activity reduced it to bones. Then the second stage, the bones were collected and sometimes decorated and wrapped in paper bark, sometimes with grave goods, and then that parcel was returned to the country the belonging to the deceased person and the parcel was put into rock shelters and caves and crevices and things. Over time, the paper bark deteriorates, the bones roll down. Um, I find them, record them, work with traditional owners to make sure they're cared for. Wow. Yeah. What, what is the day-to-day -day practice of an archaeologist? Um, depends on what kind of archaeologist you are. So oh. I, I run a consultancy that covers the Northern Territory. I do cultural heritage management. So in the Northern Territory, uh, Aboriginal and Macassan material culture is automatically protected by the Heritage Act and historical material is protected through a nomination and registration process. So if there's a developer going to be doing any ground disturbance work like building a road or an airport or a bridge or a mine or whatever, mm. I go out there first and find what's there, document it and say, avoid it. And avoidance is always the first port of call. If they can't avoid it, then we go through a process of applying for permission under the Act to conduct works on a site. And then we do salvage excavations and look after the collections. Do, do you ever, do you ever, want, like I've, I've often wondered, you know, when you're walking around major cities and stuff, just God knows what's under just under our feet. All the time. Oh, it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. When we went to Edinburgh, I felt like you could feel it. I, yeah. I love that stuff. Mm. You can feel the history. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just what what has been lost, you know, like what well, you knowledge. literally know. Yeah, but that's the thing. I <laughs> You've was, dug it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I just walk around going, oh yeah, that's that. You know, yeah. or, or there's evidence for that. It's My funny. imagination is there's people talking underneath us right now, <laughs> <laughs> just like oh, if they only knew. Look at them podcasting. Like that's. <laughs> That's sort of my... Well, I mean, when, whenever Mum and I go to visit our grand, my, my grandparents at the cemetery, yeah. you know, mm. occasionally there'll be a plot that doesn't have a stone on it yet. Yeah. And, you know, I'm... It's, you know, sometimes you can't avoid stepping on the plot. Yeah. And Mum will, f you know, old wog, she'll freak yeah. out. Like, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I always have to say to her, the entire planet is a graveyard. Exactly. You cannot be not walking on graves 24-7. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of research over the last couple of years into um, how people deal with dead bodies and how they have over time. So um, there's basically four things you can do with a dead body. And when you think about this Wait, and how many... bury it, burn it. Yeah, bury it, burn the it. The natural burial where they let the birds... Peck away. Oh, okay, sky so, burial. Yeah. Sky burial. Yeah. So that's excarnation and excarnation. mummification. Yeah. So excarnation is what happens in Western Arnhem Land with the bundle of bones in the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the same version, a similar version in Cambodia places. They put bones in big ceramic jars and put them in caves. Sky burial in Tibet, etc., where yeah. the birds come in. They used to do it in... Where was it? I'm going to get it wrong, so I'm not going to say it now. That's okay. no, but I, I, I saw a documentary about sky burials because, there's, they, because yeah. there's no dirt or soil up there. They just have to leave them on the rocks and the vultures come and pick the bones clean. Also, yeah. it's the thing of returning them back to nature in a way. Well, so that's the, the thing that fascinates Well, it's not the thing that fascinates me because what I wonder about when someone you love dies you are faced with enormous grief and also a really pressing waste disposal problem. And yeah. so I want to know how they deal with the waste disposal problem. And the way they do that is through culture that um, while grieving, they have stories that comfort them, that say that it is... Um, or... Yeah, so the Buddhist belief in uh, with the birds um, consuming the soul of the deceased and it lives on in the bird. And so... Uh, there's all sorts of things if you bury someone with food to feed them on the journey to the afterlife and whatever that afterlife looks like in that culture. So I'm less interested in that and more interested in the burial, cremation, mummification and excarnation. So. Excarnation. How, hmm. do you, how do you want your body disposed of when you die? I don't know. This is a fascinating question. Um, there's Catholic saints, and I'm no longer Catholic and nowhere near a saint, but um, <laughs> they 
sort of bedazzled them. They got jewels and they stuck them all over the bones and they're really decorative and I think that looks really fascinating. I sometimes talk to Phoebe. <laughs> you like, want to go out fabulous, basically. <laughs> yeah. Bling me up, oh, baby. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, hey, Phoebes, do you want me to be like this decorative sculpture and you can have me in your lounge room? Um, there are people that actually make human, life-size human skeletal lamps. Not hey. a, Whoa. A, not, but not real bones, though, copper, but they, they're fully posable. Still um, gross. And <laughs> Even with the fake bones, don't you think? Didn't change much for me. When I die, I want to get stuffed and I want to live on your couch as a constant, <laughs> as a constant reminder of what you've My lost. My kids annoy me. You'll have to sit with Uncle Ben. <laughs> <laughs> do you know? Do you know Gunther von Hagen, the plastination yeah, guy? Yeah. Uh, did he just die? Did he die? I think he did. Really? Well, don't quote me. Um, but, yeah, because his wife was talking about how he's going to be plastinated. Well, he will be, yeah. He's, and yeah, and yeah, she's yeah. the one that has to plastinate That him. guy, I don't know if you've, have either of you ever seen yet. Anatomy for Beginners? No. no. It's his series where oh, he yes. does autopsies. Yeah, you uh, gave that to me like ages ago. Unbelievable. Mm. Uh, it was extremely confronting, but, you know, if you can detach your kind of squeamishness from it and just watch it as a mechanical process, yeah, fucking yeah, I'm, fascinating. I'm not squeamish about bodies at all. <laughs> but he, but he's one of those guys, you know, he wears a giant fedora and he's quite an ominous man. And yeah. I just get the impression if you hadn't found this little niche, I think you'd be a serial <laughs> killer. You're oh, a very, you know, like there's this scene where he's standing over a body that's just been plastinated and he's waving the fumes into his face going, I love the smell of plastination. It smells so oh. good. <laughs> oh. It's so sinister. It's so sinister. There was that, um, uh, show that was on recently at Fox Studios, the bodies one yeah. that people um, mm. a lot of controversy. Yeah, yeah. because they those bodies they don't know whether or not well, they not were voluntary sourced. or whether they were dead before they started. Well, the theory is that so they're all Chinese dissidents yeah, that have been yeah. executed in prisons. Well, and there's yeah. there's no evidence to where heaps of them came from. Yeah, so it's yeah, like yeah. freaking horrifying. You're like, what's the difference between you know, we're artists or we're trying to educate people and we're psychotic murderers who found a really cool loophole. <laughs> like, it's like... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. From, from your perspective, from what you do, do you yeah. think it is... Distri- you know, because, like, you see, especially with Gunther von Hagen, there is mm-hmm. this kind of art aspect to what he does. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, there's that incredible uh, piece where it's a horse, who, its entire skin has been taken off, mm. and the rider is skinless as well, holding his own brain in his hand as if to say, you know, it's only through human intellect that we could tame this giant beast. Yeah. And so, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's a work of art. Oh, it is. But it's a work of art made of flesh. Mm -hmm. Do you see something inherently disrespectful in that or is that kind of... No, it comes down to consent. So if the person who has been treated in this way consented to it, then I see no problem with it at all. Um, When it comes to the archaeology of human remains. I think there are two ways archaeologists come across human remains and that is where there are uh, descendants still living who have a stake in in the, in what happens there mm. and then there are others who don't have any descendants or, that are identifiable. And so I tend to think that, for example, if you're finding Indigenous human remains, Anything you do must be with and for Indigenous people. You can't just go in and there and, and go, oh, I'm going to um, research mm. on these, do research on these bones. Whereas um, the other kind of scenario, I tend to think of it as the universal dead and that there is a hell of a lot we can learn from the remains of humans that lived in the past. Mm. And so I think it would be a tragedy to lose that opportunity just because of a, a cultural squeamishness about treating the dead uh, in particular ways, because mm. I think there are definitely ethical ways to to deal with all sorts of scenarios, not just dead bodies. I want to go to the hat soon, but yeah, sure. Um, but uh, I, I keep have this. About dead bodies. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> this is what's going to happen an hour later. I'll be like, hang on. I have, I have two questions, but okay, continue. we'll be no, no, and continue, then we'll continue. go to that. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to say because like I grew up with like this woggy thing of like spirituality and stuff, and my mum never pushing religion on us, but always being mm-hmm. like, you shouldn't be disrespectful to the dead, and you shouldn't mess with the yeah. dead, and, and like um, not what Ben said about. Uh, walking on graves as such but I have this awareness and I have this like weird thinking of like going back to the earth and Mm -hmm. you know it being a cycle and all that kind of stuff do you feel any of that stuff when you're working with bodies like are you aware of any spiritual feelings you have or people are telling you about while you're going through while you're looking at someone's bones are you are you looking at it in a scientific way first or are you looking at it how are you looking at it? Does that make sense? It, it makes sense, absolutely. And I would say definitely not a scientific basis first, very much a human first. Human where, first. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> I talk to dead people. 
Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and it's it's strange. Um, well, I work on country with Indigenous people on their traditional lands, and as we go into the country, they sing to their ancestors. It's very much a living yeah experience, experience. for you. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a very much a living culture in a living place. And so, when we find human remains, I talk to them and I say who I am and what I'm doing, and um, and so. I think that's it's really important to be sensitive about it, and I uh, and I show s- respect too for for how you're you know uh, treating this the way that like you said yeah. traditional owners want you to treat it because Absolutely. it's their yeah. history you know I I am um, a professional person, and so and I believe in science and like everything to have evidence. But there are certain things that I don't have an explanation for, and so I've had a few experiences with Indigenous people and on Indigenous land that I can't explain. And I like, as a very non-spiritual, non-religious person, I like the comfort it brings me mm. to be able to believe their culture. What kind of experience? Yeah, do you, you mind? Have? Yeah, 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 no, no, I can. Um, I had a friend that I worked with on his country for a number of years and then he got sick and passed away and I sat with him for the last 30 hours of his life and um, it was a very difficult kind of a, obviously, difficult thing to to deal with. And then um, the next time I was on his country, I was walking along with his sister and we heard a very loud clap behind us and we turned around and buffalo were running away. And buffalo don't run away, they charge you. And so it just felt like hmm. he was protecting us. Yeah, he was there. And yeah, and then a couple of months after that I was working in a new area with new traditional owners I'd never met before and as I was walking with one of the guys he said, um, you've got black fur in you, don't you? And I said, no, I, I don't actually. And he said, sure you do. He said, you, you look like you've got blackfella in you. And I said, I, I have a friend who passed away and I do believe that he looks after me on country. And he said, yeah, I can see him. I can see him hmm. in you. And he said he noticed from the first time he saw me that when I walked on the landscape, I was part of the landscape. And I said, that might be the most beautiful thing anyone has ever said to me. No. Yeah, that, yeah, that I was that much a part of the place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Magic. So, yeah, I I don't have any scientific way of explaining those feelings or that explanation. Um, I know that before he passed away, I have been charged by buffalo and wild horses and stuff. Since then, I've stepped on snakes that haven't bitten me. Um, you know... <laughs> I, I don't feel invincible, but I do feel protected. When he's with you. Yeah. That's so lovely. It's beautiful. I almost cried. <laughs> <laughs> That's so wonderful. That's, do, yeah, it's very beautiful. Do, do, do you, so, like, are you are you an atheist? Are you agnostic? Or? I'm an atheist. Right. So yeah. how, does, how does this belief in having kind of a spirit guide fit into that? I don't know. Because uh, I guess I can tell you, too, the first time... I ever experienced something I couldn't explain. I was working at the museum in Darwin and we had a storage room that had all the Aboriginal material culture, art and culture things, and within that was a storeroom where human remains and secret, sacred stuff were kept and that was going through the repatriation process to be returned. And so I never had access to that room and wouldn't expect to. But when you walked into the main room, you had to go down between these you know, massively high shelves to get to the end and turn on the lights. You could turn it on one little light at the beginning and then through the dark and turn it on. And as I was walking down this very dark high corridor, I just went through a, a patch of coldness and all the hair on the back of my neck stood on end and I could smell burning hair. And I just turned around and went straight back out to the office. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I feel freaked out now. <laughs> yeah. And one of the girls went, oh, my God, you're very pale. And I said something just happened there and I don't know what it was. And I explained it and she's like, oh, yeah, you just talk to them. They'll be fine. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. And so I went back in and I went down to turn on the lights, same place, same experience, and I just said, it's okay, my name's Karen, I'm here, I'm not going to disturb you, uh, we're working to look after you, your and objects, return everything. you to yeah, and it went away. So a- wow. So atheism wouldn't strictly be correct, right? Well, it's a 
cognitive dissonance. I do not believe in a god. No, I don't. I, but, yeah, I, I, I don't believe in a god either. But I wouldn't convince. I wouldn't say that I'm an atheist. Okay. Because to me, an a- atheism is very much a full stop at the end of a sentence. Like mm. to me, yeah, there's nothing. Well, to me, especially modern atheism as it kind of stands at the moment is it, it reeks of a type of religion to me. Mm. You know, it is a monopoly on truth. It is yeah. the dismissive of dismissal of all things. Yeah, that you can't question it. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, there was this time mm. I, I was. Uh, I, I finished a gig and as I walked out, there was a guy standing out the front of the gig mm. in an atheist T-shirt and an atheist brooch handing out atheist literature. And I was wow. like, man, you're using the exact same wow. tactics as a born-again yeah. Christian. So, you know, it does kind of uh, – I, I, I feel like the only kind of reasonable place to be is like, I don't know. In the middle. I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 an, I'm a monkey. I have no idea. <laughs> like, I, I totally really... believe in uh, spirit – Related things. No, I don't believe in spirits because that's such a loose thing. But I totally believe those experiences happen to you. And I believe that there are some people who are in touch with the dead more Mm. than others. Mm. Mm. And, you know, we mask heaps of things. I I totally believe in uh, experiences people have when they're close with someone. I told a story a while ago with Benny at one of our live shows where um, I had a partner. I was with him for five years. We were very, very close when we were young. Mm -hmm. We broke up. Um, mm. didn't speak to him for like, I don't know, a month. I started having nightmares that he was sick. I found out the next day he was in hospital. Wow. You know, that kind of stuff. But I believe if you, you know, have a connection with someone for long enough, you know, it's not the same as having a connection with people who've passed or mm. with country, but I, I totally believe in those things. I think yeah. we know so little and we use so little of our brain and some people have exercised a part of their brain that we've never even entertained using. Well, it's like that other thing that has often happened to me where I will start humming a song, turn a radio on and it's on. Yeah. And It's like a time skip. Yeah. There's this weird kind of, it's like you've had a memory of something that hasn't happened yet. Mm. You know, and that feeds into a lot of quantum oh, theory about what of... time is and yeah. time is all happening simultaneously. And I've had some really strong deja vu moments before. Mm. And, mm. and, yeah, that kind of – I don't lump that in the same category as religion. And so no. um, I'm, I'm not too caught up or hooked up on labels of what I am and what I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I'm fairly clear that I don't believe in God and I really despise organised religion. Absolutely. But I, and I, but I do think there are many things I can't explain. And well, I mean, it's a, it's a simple fact of reality that, you know, we there is literal reality happening in front of us right now that we don't have the sense to see. We can't see UV. We can't, mm. you know, there's all these things. I, I, I'm mangling the numbers, but uh, I once read this uh, thing about, you know, eyes and the eyes connection to the brain and how, you know, your eyes are literally seeing millions of pieces of information a second. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But your brain can't comprehend millions of pieces of exactly. information a second, so it narrows it down to thousands of pieces of in- So there's little reality unfolding right here and now. Yeah. And who's to say that there aren't energy fields? Or, yeah, all the well, words the simplest there. example is walk into an art class where 20 people are drawing the same thing and they don't look anything alike. Yeah. Mm. But they're all well, seeing there's... different things, they're seeing different colours, they're seeing different shapes, they're yeah. seeing different shades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also that um, video of the... Um, two teams, one wearing black ah, shirts, yeah, one wearing gorilla. white. Yeah, the gorilla comes yeah. through, yeah. But if you're, if you're busy counting the basketball passes, you don't see the gorilla because you're not looking. And so I think that we don't see a hell of a lot of stuff that actually comes before us. Um, just one more question about dead bodies. Yeah, sure. Uh, before we get to the hat. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right. One more question. <laughs> Do you think that uh, there is a profound disadvantage to us being so separated from the dead in Western civilization. Absolutely. And so I think that death has been medicalised and commercialised over the last 150 years in a way that it never has been before. Mm. And there's been a really what I would call a rapid cultural shift. 150 Mm. years sounds like a long time, but it's it's really short. Yeah. And so in the 1870s, cremation was illegal. It took in the UK 15 years of lobbying to make it legal. Yeah. And now... Um, because it went against the religious... Right. Seen as immoral or something. Yeah, well, it seemed uh, you're, you're burning God's creation. Right, It's right. still like that in Judaism. Can't, yeah. can't cremate a body in Judaism. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. But now 70% of people in the UK are cremated. Mm. So that is a massive shift. Yeah, that's um, huge. Yeah. In a few generations. It's not yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But also we we are very removed from watching our loved ones die, yeah. from caring for them after they've died, and um, there have been a lot of unscrupulous funeral homes 
terms that have said, oh, you must cremate you, yeah, or, yeah. or you must uh, embalm. Embalm. And you Embalming must... is just, Yeah, and so there, there are massive environmental problems with mm. the funeral industry and all sorts of things that shouldn't happen and there's now movements for green burials and, yeah. um, you know, less energy consumption options for cremation, et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah, I think... and. I think the way a society treats its dead bodies tells you a lot about the society. Right. And on that basis, we are the most boring people that have ever lived. Yeah, yeah. I'll elaborate on that. Because we we're so distant from it. We have cemeteries that are designed around how quickly you can take a lawnmower and a whippersnipper over the top of it. Yeah. We have crematorium walls that are just single bricks with with identical plaques mm. and yeah. there's no mm. personality, there's no celebration of the people, yeah. there's no feeling. Yeah of who they were. And I love nothing more than to go to an old cemetery yeah. and, and read the inscriptions and look at the, the statuary. Yeah. And, yeah, I think we, we miss a lot. People used to use cemeteries as parks. They would go and have picnics on a Sunday. Yeah. They would take the train out and, you know, put a blanket out near their grandma yeah. and have a good conversation. We don't do that anymore. There's a, there's a cemetery that's in um, Romania. I only know because it was on like a Bourdain show. Mm -hmm. But um, when people die, they write their sins on the plaque. So I'd be like, oh, they lived oh. well, they lived too well that they <laughs> drove the car down the ditch or something, you know. <laughs> and it's like how now they, in, yeah, yeah, they're next to neighbor's <laughs> wife, exactly. So there's that type of stuff. But I was actually talking to a um, friend of Ben and mine about death recently because both of her parents had passed in the mm -hmm. last year and just how difficult it was and how no one talked about it. And I always yeah. joke that my mum is way too comfortable with discussing death because <laughs> Ben's always like, aren't you petrified of death? And I'm I'm not and I think it's because my mum – I talks about it too much like okay. the other day I was like how are you going and she's like good she's like I'm worried about your sister and I was like you don't need to worry about her and she's like oh but I'll be dead you know one day and I'm like why are we talking <laughs> about death again that's like, such a you, European thing I know I know but exactly like yeah. but it's that whole thing of like I mean I would be you know yeah beyond devastated if my mother passed but my mum's so comfortable with it that in a way it comforts me of course. and it's like and I was talking to our friend about it and she's just like I had didn't know not did not know how to do with any of this I didn't yeah. have any of these tools my family did not talk about this yeah. you know it was a shock well, she, she was like you know it, she just looked like she was just blowing in the wind freaked out yeah. not, and I still not that I could know what to do if that happened to me tomorrow mm. but it's just how far removed we are from it as well I think yeah I don't know because Phoebe and I talk about it a lot because dead bodies are my work yeah um, and well she thinks it's really funny I have a section of my bookshelf dedicated to human remains um, and so, <laughs> oh you're so cool <laughs> she just comes around and she's like I'll have a look at this one you know and and so we go through all sorts of stuff and she's like oh that's fascinating and I, we went to London I've taken to London a couple of times and, and both times my work plays into this. When she was 16, I went, oh, look, that's a Roman wall. That wall is 2,000 years old. And she was like, I've seen rock art that's 20,000 years old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's so interesting Whatever, about a 2,000-year-old brick wall? Yeah. And then the second time uh, we were there together was 2015 at Christmas time. And through a friend, I got in touch with the people that run the old Brompton Cemetery and right. they have an, an underground crypt that the public's not allowed into, but they took us for an underground cool. tour. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so we weren't allowed to take any photos, but she's just like, this is fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah. And it's incredible because it's such a stable environment, things don't deteriorate. So there are 150-year-old bouquets of flowers oh, wow. that look like they were just like dried a couple of years ago. It's and amazing. Yeah, and so she, she likes all of that stuff and we talk about death a lot, but any time I mention the fact that I might get hit by a bus tomorrow, she's like, oh, I don't want to well, think about that. Remote. Yeah, but and so when you ask, what do I want done with my dead body? I've got no idea. Mm. And she just goes, oh, my God, I'm responsible for that. Yeah. Um, so she, Oh, right, yeah, yeah she yeah, feels so, that. Yeah, so unless I make the decision and make those wishes clear to her, it's just this completely overwhelming thing because she knows that she'll be overwhelmed by the emotion and she knows that... Um, she'll have to make the choice about what to do with me. And she knows that I don't want a Catholic burial, which mm. is what the rest of my family would have mm. or possibly what they'd arrange for me if it was their choice. And so um, I think she would just be completely overcome and unable to start the process. Um, but it's something that must be leaned, from, leaned into. My, from my experience, you know, when my grandparents were still alive, we mm -hmm. spoke openly about their deaths. Yeah. Very openly, you know. Uh, it is an Eastern European thing. Yeah, well, but, but you <laughs> know, it was, also, yeah. it was also for me to psychically prepare myself. You know, yeah. when, I, when my grandfather hit 80, 85, 86, it mm -hmm. suddenly hit me in the face. Like, like, oh, you basically have a terminal illness. Like, yeah. you could see him getting greyer. You're not going to be here withering. forever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, A, it makes you, 
really cherish the time you have. Yeah. But B, it really does psychically prepare you for what is to come. And yeah. uh, conversely, my mum, you know, when she found out that I was talking to them, she was like, How, "Like, why are you talking to this about them? They don't want to think about this. And it's like, well, it, this is the next stage of their life. It's like not yeah. talking to a 12-year-old about puberty. You've got yeah. to fucking talk about it. And so she was ruined for well, years after. parents, though, as well. Of course, of course. Yeah. I'm not saying that that makes it easier because they're your grandparents. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, they yeah. were basically like my parents. Yeah, Mum's yeah. like my big sister. Mm-hmm. Um, but from my experience of their body, so my grandfather died and I had the opportunity to spend time with his body and didn't because okay. uh, I was so afraid and yeah. the idea of just being around a dead body was so horrific. Uh And so I feel like even now, whatever it is, 14 years later, I still haven't properly computed yeah. his death. Okay. Whereas I was with my grandma when she died, I watched her exit. Yeah. Her, you know, her soul shot out of the top of her head. Yeah. And I spent probably two or three hours with her body. Okay. And I feel like I've completely assimilated that event yeah. because I had that opportunity to see the husk left behind. Mm. And it was... I saw my granddad's body. Um, he was the first dead body I saw when I was nine years old. And so uh, large Catholic family, small viewing room about this size, uh, short people to the front, I was right at the <laughs> casket and, yeah. and looking in. And that was very confronting yeah. for a nine-year-old. And my grandma um, sort of pushed through the crowd and came in and put his rosary beads in his chest pocket and kissed him on the forehead. And I went, Whoa. oh, my God, she kissed a dead person. Yeah. Um, and it was a really weird, very Catholic thing. There were 16 priests and a bishop officiating at the funeral and it was like thousands of people. And then we went home and my younger brother Jez and I played little Lego funerals for weeks <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. So I think however you process it, we processed that. Like it yeah. was um, it was in your face, it was big, it was ceremonial, and I think ceremony and culture does play a huge part in allowing you to move through stages of, of It should group. be in your face. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah have, you, have you ever seen the show Six Feet Under? No, I oh, haven't. You should I've watch it, it if you yeah. love dead bodies. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's my favourite show ever, but the, the, the first – we'll get to the hat. Um, my, <laughs> That's all right. Uh, my, 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 the, there's well, a, I'll be the first guest that you don't get to the hat. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's, there's a scene in that uh, the, the patriarch of the family dies mm-hmm. and it's a, it's a very clinical funeral and every yeah. time someone cries, they're led into a room so that they don't upset everyone else. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And the son oh. who's come back into the fold after many years, he's freaking out going, what are you doing? Like, why are you taking her away? Yeah. We should be screaming. We should yeah. be tearing our fucking hair out. This yeah. is the only father we'll ever have. Mm-hmm. And we've turned it into this clinical, clean thing. It's not clean. It's yeah. it's awful. My yeah. my partner's brother-in-law was saying he's Iranian, he's Persian. Yeah. And he said um, they went to a funeral and his mum, who's, uh, in his words, very Persian, was like, did you see them? They weren't grieving. They didn't even hit themselves. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, that's not grief. There's no slapping involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's no, like, beating one's shoulder with a shoe. Yeah. It's, it's funny because I went to a funeral. It was my brother's girlfriend and she was in a car accident at 18. So a lot of teenage people, first funeral ever, <laughs> and they were just howling in the church, as you do. And my mum was going, oh, if they could just control themselves. No. And I went, no, no, this, really? is, this is the time they're allowed to cry. Yeah. And then when my Indigenous friend died and I was very involved with the family and, and um, organising the funeral and it was, it was completely different. I've never been part of uh, an Indigenous funeral before. And when we knew he had less than 24 hours to live, we brought his family, his teenage daughters and his wife and his mother-in-law into the room and his 18-month-old son, and they just lay over his legs on the hospital bed and screamed. Um, and that that wailing grief, yeah. and and I was like, God, how do you how do you deal with purge? This? Yeah, purge it out. but he was still alive at that point. And the worst thing was he was in a coma, and uh, nobody had told him he was going to die. But I think he could still hear because really he cried. He yeah, and it was just so devastating. And then the funeral, which was held quite a while later was the wailing kind of grief where people hit themselves on the head with rocks and there's oh, blood Jesus. everywhere and and I gave the eulogy and I just it was so foreign to me but also you could see the catharsis 
Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, letting it out in the way that made sense to people. Yeah, and I think, I mean, if you had to choose, I would choose a version of grief that let me howl. Uh, yeah. I watched, did you watch Tick Fucking Talk on the ABC no. last week? It's no. It's the Doug Anthony All-Stars um, documentary, two episodes. It's still on iView, fantastic. Um, and Tim, of course, has MS, yeah. and in part of that he reads... A poem, and I can't remember the poem or, or the person that wrote it, but it is that real grief of um, let the world fall apart. It has to fall. Like, how can it go on yeah. the way it was because yeah. everything is lost? Yeah. Um, and I think that's what grief has to feel like. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, again, that friend I was talking about was saying, because she's looking for comfort in things, I guess, and we talked about it today, and she's like, oh, you know, People believe in, you know, two years, takes two years for the mourning process to like, yeah, but you need those things though. You need those rituals or you need those um, things in place, whether it's wailing or, I mean, I don't know, the idea of not crying in a church is pretty foreign to me. Mm. But um, like that, you know, you need those things in place to help you continue, don't you? You need like... I think it's a very Anglo kind of Western civilization thing to be very uncomfortable around raw emotion and also to... the British stiff upper lip. Yeah, and also that desire to, I can fix this. I'm trying to remember when my nonno died... It was in Melbourne, the funeral, and my I was young and my only memory is because we were the immediate family, we all had to stand up and all these Italian relatives that I barely knew, I remember my sister and I feeling horrible because they were all my nonnos, like my grandfather's closer friends, saying I'm so sorry to us mm. and crying to us and kissing us on both cheek and you stood in a line and they all came That's through. That's how they were yeah. doing, yeah. 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 But I remember even being really young and being like, oh, I feel like I should be saying it to them because they're his friends and I'm his granddaughter but they're, you know, like... Mm. Yeah. It was there was still the formality there. It wasn't the same as don't cry in church. Yeah. But it was like they need to who do this right. for you. Yeah, yeah. Who has the right? Who who can mourn more or less? Mm. Who you know? There's still those like quiet rules that are in place. My, my extended family tried to shut my mom down at her mother's funeral. Whoa. Oh whoa! That yeah. would not happen. You know, you know. Okay, that's enough. And it's like no, no, no. Oh, it's not enough. It'll yeah. never be enough. Mm. If she wants to fucking sit here for 24 hours screaming and pulling her hair out, she can Just sit here for 24 her. hours and scream and pull her hair out. Yeah. It's but, amazing know, to me that people aren't comfortable... It makes people with sadness. They're mm. not comfortable with sadness, and I think that's just not just about grief. I think no, generally, generally Western civilization oh, is yeah. very um, bad at sitting with negative emotions. Oh, totally. What, yeah. is, what is that? Why do you think that is that is that a Catholic thing? No, I don't think it's a Catholic thing. I think it's very much a Western thing, where um, maybe it's come out of the version of masculinity that we put up as the the goal of a successful life. You mm. must be strong. Uh, and so um, women are derided for being weak and emotional, so there's an, uh, um, an encouragement to, to pack it all in a box or to keep it private and hide it. I think, yeah, yeah. I think that over generations of this, and particularly um, the 20th century was pretty shit with wars and depressions. <laughs> and that was right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Got the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> Got the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> Elvis, there was Elvis some was around Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> but the people that survived the horrors of the 20th century did so by being incredibly resilient yep. and in many ways they had to tamp down the trauma and just get on with life. And I think once you've done... Oh, yeah, everyone's parents that we know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. if you've done that, sometimes you might think that emotions are a little bit indulgent. It doesn't mean you've processed yours. And overrated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think and I think, no, you go. I think we're realising the unhealthiness of that now. Yeah, and it's it, it, I think there is something to that idea of it's a it's a masculinity thing. Because when my gram when my grandpa died, mm-hmm. I started cracking up while I was doing his not cracking up laughing, cracking up no. crying while I was doing his eulogy. And I felt that, you know, like be a man, yeah. be a man, and, you know, sucked it up and didn't cry uh, and couldn't fucking cry for years after it. But, yeah. you know, later on when I accessed crying, it's, mm-hmm. it's you know, I mean, feelings of masculinity are very ephemeral anyway, but I mm. definitely felt more, maybe masculine is the wrong word, but more adult when yeah. I learnt to cry. And now there's rarely a week that I don't have a good cry. Mm. 
mm. you know, and it, it's, well, I'm it's so grateful cathartic. that I can access that emotion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've um, seen a psychologist for quite a while. Um, back when I was an army wife, my husband went to war, came back fucked up as people do, and we started seeing a psychologist who specialises in post-traumatic stress disorder and the impact on families. And once my husband decided to stop seeking treatment, I'm like, well, I'm finding this really helpful. So I just kept going and I see him uh, when I need to. And he has always said, cry if you need to, because physiologically tears have been tested to actually release a lot of stress chemicals. Mm. Oh, yeah. You feel great after yeah. it. No, it yeah. Feels it feels as good it as feels having a great really... belly laugh. Yeah. 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 And it's amazing because this year has been a, a very difficult year for me because I've been sick since January and it's October now. Um, and so I have had a chronic migraine since the 21st of January, like constant. Oh. Um, Sunday was the first day with no symptoms. Yay. Wow. Uh, so I'm finally feeling a heck of a lot better than I was, but it, it was really, really strange. And there was one time in the middle of that where um, my migraine came with a lot of extra neurological manifestations, they call right. them. Um, and part of it was the inability to deal with stress. And a stressful event happened, and I ended up slumped against the wall in a dissociative state. So, oh my God. so I, I lost consciousness. My eyes were open and I was crying, but I just wasn't aware you of it. There. I wasn't there at all. I don't know how long I was out for. This, this happened I, because you were in a stressed out state as a side effect? It was, yeah, it's a symptom of the migraine. Okay. Um, so my psychologist later described it as literally the flight or fight response. So he said that if I was in the plains of Africa being attacked by a big cat, you wouldn't want to be conscious when it killed you so your brain just shuts well, down well it's fight right. flight or freeze now when they talk yeah. about trauma with children and adults a yeah bit, but yeah and so the freeze was so what thing, happened was what happened and so i was slumped against the wall and crying and when i came to i'd had tears uh dripping down off my elbow and i got some paper towel to clean them off the tiles and they were like candle wax Whoa. I'm just like, there is something fascinating here that I don't have the brains to deal with right now. (laughs) 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 If my brain was working right, this would be interesting. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. But it was phenomenal. Like the the physiology of stress, I think we really underestimate. And it's funny because my Uh migraine was partially um, because of burnout. And I look at my Facebook memories for three years, I've been sharing articles on burnout going, oh, sounds like I'm heading for burnout. And I did nothing about it mm. until it wiped me out completely to the point that my brain would not work. Oh, stress has a huge impact on everything. Mm. I mean, if I'm uh, – we Ben and I talk about it all the time, mental health. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, if I'm, <laughs> but if I'm anxious, first thing is my memory will go. Yep. But immediately go. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm an anthropologist. like, cool, so you're a – Gone. Yeah, no, I'm exactly gone. The same. Like so, completely. You know, and there's all the and then there's all I'm the physical not. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I know, but that's what I mean. It's like but then you'll be like, I know, Ben when Ben first told me that was part of the joke is when he first told me that you were an archaeologist, he goes, Oh, she's an archaeologist is gonna be really interesting. I was like, Cool. And I was like really, really stressed out and I go, So, um, what type of anthropology? <laughs> but it was like a, it was like a minute after, which was the whole thing. Well, but it's funny because I have short term yeah. memory loss as part of this migraine. Okay, and so yeah. When I, when I came back to work in July, I thought, I think I'm doing okay. And I was working in Western Arnhem Land and at the end of the day, one of the guys said to me, I was showing them photos of what had I seen, something like buffaloes in the afternoon, and he's like, oh, I'll show them the crocodiles you saw this morning. I'm like, I didn't see any crocodiles this morning. And he just looked at me really strangely. And then later on I was flicking through photos looking for something else and I'm like, oh, I did see crocodiles wow. this morning. <laughs> yeah, that's related to stress. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's amazing what the brain does. It's yeah. like you can't cope with all this, so we're going to chop that off for now. You yeah. can access it when you're ready. But the weirdest yeah. thing is, is that when you don't make short-term memories, they don't become long-term memories either. So I can't yeah, they just believe disappear. it's October now because I can't remember most of this year. Mm. Um, wow. It's just a black hole. Wow. Mm. That's full on. I can get to the end of a day and go, did I go to work today? Really? Yeah. Related to the stress and the migraine-related issues? Well, it's just a constant migraine now. I mean, it's a lot better now than it was, but, yeah, at its worst I sat in the dark for four months and couldn't do daily. Is that related to stress or is that related to some other stuff that you're investigating? Um, There are other factors as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so allergies and all sorts of things. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But um, the brain just, I think once you go beyond a certain point, it goes, fuck it, I'm not going to work until you sort your shit out. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, burnout's real. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's heaps, like empathy fatigue is real. Oh, Because 
Um, we're going to Ben and I have worked in uh, situations where it requires a huge amount of empathy. Mm-hmm. It's bottomless. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and people that I've worked with have said, you know, you should work in a situation like that five years max because people mm. burn out and they burn out bad. Yeah. And I've seen it happen to a few of my friends where I'm like, oh, you're a shadow of a human now. Yeah. And then they go away for a year and come back and you're like, oh. Yeah, there you are. Like they, they, yeah. they literally lose themselves because yeah. your brain just can't handle it. Exactly. I think empathy burnout comes from if you're working, say, in social services or something like that. I mm-hmm. think empathy burnout comes from the idea that you can change an yeah. outcome. It's the inability to control anything. Exactly. That's stressful. And I've found from my own life, if I adjust my thinking to be look. I probably can't change an outcome, but I can change right now. A day. Mm. I can change this minute. Yeah. And I'll make this minute great for that person. Exactly. That has allowed me to be able to compartmentalise a lot easier and Mm. kind of, you know, I mean, you almost have to develop a kind of coldness is maybe too far, but for want of a better phrase, an ability to separate, exactly, to to just distance yourself from it and go, look, this afternoon was great. Yes. And tomorrow... I can't do anything about tomorrow. Yeah. But in a way as well, it's I, I sort of uh, had a point where I felt like I was suffering from a bit of empathy fatigue and mm-hmm. then I sort of, yeah, mm-hmm. Ben was, was there. Yeah. And then I sort of overcame it to the other side where now yeah. I feel like I'm a much better person yeah. mm. and I'm much happier because yeah. I laugh at things more. I take myself less seriously. I, I find humour in how flawed we are as people unless you're hurting someone else. Mm. You know, you I don't know. There's a few things that have come from it which are good qualities, I think, that oh, I... Yeah have now but did you have to consciously amend your perspective yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, i had to consciously make some choices because what i was doing was not working for me i was feeling very hopeless i was feeling really sad i was feeling tired all the fucking time you know Mm -hmm. like doing a gig and people being like you're tired every time you come here and you're like fuck i don't want to be that person that's so shit you know i mean even now there's a bit of that but i'm in my 30s that's my excuse but like god i'm in my 40s i still haven't sorted that shit (laughs) (laughs) but it's like laughing at, uh, you know, things that you can't necessarily... Looking for humour in things that, uh, it's going to sound bad, seem very dark. No, gallows you know. humour. No, gallows gallows humour is a great. very necessary yeah, thing. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Should, we, should we quickly do the hat? We can do... Yeah, let's <laughs> do, do like let's 15 do minutes of the hat. All right, all right, all right. Why not? Yeah, why yeah. not? All right, reach okay. into the hat. Reach into the hat. Whatever your first thoughts are on the word. <laughs> <laughs> What's the word? What is it? History. Oh, <laughs> Okay. So we'll just continue the conversation we've had, essentially. There's some magic when that happens. Okay, yeah. History, first thoughts, um, all we have is now. Right. Yeah, so actually I did a comedy show on part of this. Um, Basically it was everything I learned in archaeology of the rules to live a good life. And I don't know if I can remember it off the top of my head because I did this when I had memory loss and a migraine. Uh, I finished writing the show the day before it started. Uh, Brave. Well, (laughs) I had no choice by that point. Um, My language and memory skills were so bad that I was talking about Egyptian stuff and I forgot the word for those Egyptian pointy buildings. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) So I just described them like that. (laughs) You're like, archaeologist, my ass. Like, I am, I promise. (laughs) But I did a bit about migraines at the beginning and they were just like, oh, that sounds not true. And then it fucking happens in the And they're like, oh, shit, she was, you know, not kidding about that. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. But, um... Oh, so so the rule of archaeology, I think there were six of them. Um... And it was the closest thing I've got to religion is the last rule, is taphonomy. Taphonomy is what happens to a site after it's created. So Atlantis slides under the sea and earthquakes tumble tumble temples and all of that. Um, So you can't control that. Shit happens. Mm. And all you've got is now. And so I think that history is incredibly important. It's very incredibly significant and valuable and you can learn from it. But there's also that saying... um, People who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. People who do know their history are doomed to cry at a bar while everyone else repeats it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think sometimes it's difficult to know your history and to watch other people ignore it. Do you think that we are currently repeating mm-hmm. bad traits, <laughs> trends in history? Uh, yeah, Do you exactly. feel like it's last days of Rome? I feel like it's uh, the rise of the Third Reich. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's really scary because we know how these things work and we know how they turn out. Yeah, yeah they don't end well. Not at all. So. From, from, from an archaeological perspective, how do you think, you know, assuming there are humans plotting around the earth, 
you know, whatever, 500 years, 1,000 years from now, how do you think that our, our current age will be remembered? Oh, I think it'll be remembered in a few different ways. Um, in archaeology, when you dig something up and you don't know what it was, you say, I'm probably used for ritual purposes. So I think there'll be a lot of electronics that people don't understand a mm. thousand years from now. They'll just be um, inert boxes full of weird metal shit mm. and plastic. Um, but whatever records we manage to maintain and uh, allow people to understand, I think will not show the current age in a great light because mm. capitalism has overtaken everything mm. and it drives our culture in ways that we don't like to acknowledge. Mm. So I think we have greater income inequality now than has ever been the case anywhere. Really? Um, I, I don't have any um, strict facts to to back that up. And there has yeah, it always makes sense, been... though. People are wealthier really? than they've even, ever been and people you, are poorer than... But even yeah. if you compare that to, you know, ancient Egypt or something, you know, Pharaoh versus, you know, the slave the building slave. the pyramids. Yeah, there has always been social stratification in societies, but I don't think it's been as extreme as it is now. Right. Yeah. What, in terms of the decadence of the rich? Yeah, I think so. When you look at billionaires, mm. um, so time and money are fascinating things, um, and they're they're concepts that are really hard to get our head around. And I have people, lots of people, say to me, "Oh, so ancient humans lived with dinosaurs, right?" And I'm like, "No." Um, <laughs> so, um, Aboriginal people came to witch, yeah. witch. <laughs> Aboriginal people came to Australia over sixty thousand years ago, and dinosaurs were sixty four million years ago. And if they still can't comprehend the difference in that, I say, think of it as dollars. If someone gave you sixty thousand dollars and someone gave you $64 million. Right. Um, that's an easier way for them to, to comprehend that. Really? That's yeah. interesting. It has mm. to be monetary. It's unfucking believable It is. And you think now we have trillion-dollar companies and we have this massive amount of wealth concentrated in the hands of very few individuals and mm. how are they going to use it? One of the things I find fascinating is the idea of mining asteroids in space and how some companies like Elon Musk's um, various companies are wanting to capitalise on that. And mm. I heard uh, Professor Brian Cox in a lecture saying how wonderful this was heroes. going to be. I saw him and I reconsidered that. Okay. Um, yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. And so um, the problem is about who owns it. And mm. I think about this in terms of who owns the past. You can't commercialise history. Uh, it's not up to it, – it doesn't have a monetary value. It has a value far in excess of anything a dollar could put on it. And so when you think about – um, humans going to the moon for the first time. They put an American flag on that. Yeah. <laughs> that does not mean America owns the moon. Space has to be for everyone. And if you start getting commercial interests mining in space, then you start getting uh, competition and war. And you've already got some countries um, trying to get military action happening in space. And that, I think is incredibly scary and it will be run by the richest people in the world at the expense of the poorest people in the world. Yeah. And I have huge problems with that. Do you think that the <laughs> do you think that the collapse of our civilization is inevitable? Yes. It, it just yeah, seems, it just happens. You yeah, know? Of, course, yeah. of course. All civilizations die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah do do you think that that's something that will occur in our lifetimes? Close to it. Really? Yeah. When I you say think. close to it, do you mean Two generations? Do you mean 200 years? I Do you mean within the next 100 years, Western civilization will be unrecognisable. Really? D mm. Due to collapse or just due to technological change that we cannot... You know, the way the way that our civilization is now unrecognisable as to what it was in the 80s. Uh, it's very recognisable, um, but slightly different to the 80s. So we, we still have all the Western mores, et cetera, and um, political systems, et cetera. But what I think is happening is that um, democracy is being undermined after 2,000 years of mm. being a, a developing and well well placed political system. Uh, we have population growth in areas and cultures that are very different to our own. No. And I think the uh, the Chinese and the Russians ha will have more influence, no. um, particularly economically. The US is going to go down the drain very quickly. I think that this century is probably going to be led by the Chinese yep. in the way the last century was led by the Americans and the century before that was led by the Brits and the century before that was the Dutch and the Portuguese. So yep. it's not new. Um, 
But also the rate of change now is much more rapid than it has ever been before and it's coupled with climate change. So when you see the IPCC report that came out oh, that God. says, you know, we're at the point of no return basically yeah. um, because we don't have the political will to change anything in major countries no. at the moment. So I think that there will be massive environmental change and massive political change and massive cultural change as a reaction to those two things. And there may be um, extensive wars based on access to resources that we currently don't fight over. So water will be mm. one of the biggest issues. Yeah. And um, the displaced people from rising sea levels will be yeah, the- bigger than the current... Yeah. Uh, refugee crisis. That's right, and uh, that, that that you know when people talk about that, that's what I you know it's like look how we treat refugees now. Mm. What's ha- what happens if Indonesia goes underwater? You yeah. know, like are well, we gonna- within a hundred years, we are going to have a, a bigger problem than we currently have. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. and then it, and then it becomes what is the psychic benefit? What is the psychic effect of you know? not allowing millions and millions and millions of people in. Yeah, exactly. Um, you don't get me started on this shit because I will fucking... <laughs> He's I just going to talk about... We, we always uh, debate... I will get lost this. down the plug hole of this. No, that's fine. I'm just thinking we've done a lot of, like, dead bodies and now we're doing climate no, change no, and no, war and that's this podcast. Cultures. That's fine. This is really <laughs> right. um, it's perfectly fine. Is it, is ben it, and I yeah, talk about this all the time because he always talks about the apocalypse and I always say I think it's going to be interesting no matter how it plays out. I think it will yeah, be... Yeah, I'm with you, actually, because I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the apocalypse because, again, all we have is now. We mm. can't. We can't. We as individuals can't do much about the future. I will say, when I read that UN report this week, <laughs> oh, ben. Uh, that said basically we're cooked in twelve years. Yeah, we're fucked. Uh, we're fucked. Uh, uh, for the first time, and I and Jen knows this. I think about all of this a lot, and mm-hmm. I get very wrapped up in it, and very emotional, and very yeah. you know because it's very stressful. because in my in my heart, I am an idealist and I am an optimist, and mm. it's the it's the loss of potential that breaks my heart because I think humans have the potential to be God, godlike yes. creatures. Uh, but for the first time, when I read that, I almost had this sense of um, freedom calm? and relief. Yeah. That's where I feel. It yeah. was a sense of calm. It was like, well, just, look, just if the world's cooked go. in 12 years, yeah. let's make the most of the time we have. Let's not do yeah. anything we don't want to do. Yeah. Let's not spend time with people we don't want to spend time with. And let's just value right now. And right yeah. now I've got my buckwheat pillow and I've got my food and I've got my friends and yeah. everything's lovely. And and I feel a sense of relief that I have not felt in a long time. And I feel yeah. like as much as we know, we don't know. Yeah. Mm, like we know oh, a lot, absolutely. but I mean, from the beginning of the time of time, sorry, people of something was going to kill everyone. Mm. Like yeah. there's always, there's always something that was going to end it all <laughs> really soon. And yeah. that doesn't mean I don't believe in all of this. Of course I do. We talk yeah. about it all the time. You know, I, you know, yeah. not a fucking idiot. It's going to happen. <laughs> but it's infuriating when people say it's not, but yeah. of course it's going to happen. But I just think we've uh, humans have always had a reason to feel as if the world is going to end, mm. you know, to drive us, I think, as humans. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But it, it also doesn't mean that I, we can spend the next, you know, however long our lives are mm. thinking about how fucked it all is mm. or we can see how it plays out. Yeah. yeah. I'd rather just and watch the show. I'm, and that's where I'm starting <laughs> yeah. to move. I want to yeah. see the show. <laughs> Let's pull up a deck chair in Martin Place when civilization collapses. It's an interesting time to be alive. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm, I, I'm accepting but not. So I can see it's coming and I would love to be in the same headspace as you, Ben, where you're like, oh, that's a relief. I just sit back and watch it happen. I think the thing that frustrates me the most is that I think if we had more women in positions of power, we would not be in the position we're in now. I agree with that. When you look at countries like Rwanda, which now have over 64% of um, their parliamentarians are women, and the whole turnaround of that country in terms of economy, education for girls is 98% now. Mm. They're uh, a massively growing economy and a very positive nation. If we had that kind of input... um, a, we wouldn't be in the shit we are now, and B, we would be taking action to get out of it. I feel like it's still politics still in the 50s in oh terms God. of the oh, dudes. I mean, the men works. are fucking dinosaurs as well. Yeah. Yeah. Get some young blood in there who are actually in touch with people. But I know that if you got anyone who was, like, below, you know, 45, they'd be like, they know fuck all about everything. And well, Australia to, is so I, I, conservative. I think, I think men have, oh, I think men have to, like, 
recede, honestly. Like yeah. it's it's you know, you look at those guys that confirmed Brett Kavanaugh and oh. most of them are in their mid eighties. I know. Yeah. That's it's what I mean. They're not they're like so You know, but then on the oh, but then on the flip side of that, you've got a lot of guys in their early twenties that are buying into this whole alt right fucking yeah. you know Did you uh, see? Uh, proud boy mentality, which is fucking terrible. Is there a lot of those guys though? Mm, yeah, yeah, it's they're galvanized, man. Yeah. yeah, did you see the fascist group that tried yeah. to infiltrate the young nationals? Absolutely, that yeah, 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 yeah. So scary. And I don't know what's being done about it now, but it's obvious that that's what's happening now. As someone who thinks in, we do have to wrap up in a minute, but as someone mm. who thinks in deep time, yeah. uh, does thinking in deep time brings me a lot of solace. Yeah. You know, like you look at pictures of Chernobyl, mm-hmm. and that was, what, 30 years ago? Yeah. And it's, well, nature has already reclaimed Chernobyl. Yeah, and yeah. And, and you know, every time I see a tree root tearing up a freeway, it's like you can you can pave over everything, but if we go away... It doesn't take long. It does not take yeah. long. And I feel like we can irradiate the earth, we can destroy everything on it, mm-hmm. but in the scale of deep time, it will recover. We can't, you know, this idea that we will destroy the earth is uh, is a lie. We no, can't, we we're not going to destroy, destroy the earth. We'll destroy ourselves. Yeah. And we might destroy every living species that currently resides. But maybe that is our role. We are, we, we, you know, we're the harbingers hmm. of the, the Anthropocene and we are just yeah. the next Yeah, because it's like, what are, you know, what? how is this meant to play out? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think definitely we are going to ruin human civilization, and it will, we will die off and the planet will take over. And Do you think humans will be around in, say, 500,000 years? No. At all? On any In any capacity? There may be hominids, human-like primates, but they won't be us. Wow. Um, yeah. Two or three hundred thousand years would be gone. But do you really think we'd be around? No, that? I don't. Because whenever, yeah, I, whenever well, I hear like, about people like Brian Cox going, "We're going to be a spacefaring civilization," a bit, you know, you know, when the sun explodes, we, we we should have figured out a way to get out of our solar system by then. Are you, like, are you fucking it's kidding not me? Not going to happen. We are. We're, we're to our consciousness. The software of our consciousness is not sophisticated enough. It's it, we're, we're we're you know I we're still very much ruled by a primal brain. Too slow. Well, yeah, and that's I think what it's, I mean by it's in the fifties. They're just yeah. like they're not in touch with well, the, the, where the, we are now. The individual will not change bad behaviour until something drastic happens. You know, mm. the, the smoker will not quit smoking until they get a diagnosis of lung cancer. Yeah. So you're not going to get an entire civilization to go, yeah, all right, let's not have iPhones anymore. Yeah. It's just not going to happen until something catastrophic happens. Mm. Uh, Especially the people that are talking about these things aren't going to be around that much longer. Like you said, a lot of the guys are in their eighties. Yeah, They're kind of yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had a good life. <laughs> and is it true that because so much of our Current civilization is digital. That mm-hmm. if we do get wiped out, most of that will be most of our knowledge and most of our culture will be lost to time. Well, we're already losing it. So um, organisations like the National Archive have uh, systems in place for archiving what they're calling born digital records. But uh, the rate of change in technology is so quick that formats become obsolete and you lose everything. You will lose all your kids' baby photos. You will yeah. unless you back them up and, and deal with them properly. So yeah, we are at a hugely unrecognised crisis in terms of information management. Mm. We're going to lose a lot of cultural knowledge and personal knowledge and, yeah, you just can't get that back. So in terms of history, I'm very much a fan of hard copies, etc. Yeah. History literally is the written record yeah. and that's why they say prehistoric. When a culture doesn't have writing, I prefer ahistoric because it has less judgmental value. But, um, yeah, I, I just don't see how what we're doing today will be a positive for the future. Mm. So I think it's a net negative what we're doing today. And mm. that's that's a bit sad. This is supposed to be fun. Right? <laughs> so. It's alright. It's a pretty fucking dark way to wrap it up. No, we great. actually I do have to wrap it up. It. I love it. I'm excited so for the future. Good. I feel like yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you so it much, Karen. We don't know pleasure. what happens. Thank awesome. you, Ben. Thanks. Yes, um, thank, thank you for very having much. me. Do you would you like to put a word into our hat for a future guest? Is there anything that comes to mind? Um I thought I was going to get hit with the word time. <laughs> we can chuck that in. Enough, so yeah. yeah, yeah, time. time. Perfect. Um, oh, I'd love to put another one in. Yeah. Yeah. We we'll chuck in the word time. And joy. And joy. Ah, lovely. Yeah. Karen, is there anything you'd like to plug? Um, I guess just my website, kcmonica.com, because when I get up and running again, that's where everything will be. Great. Awesome. So I'm on Twitter as well, kcmonica underscore. And Thank Instagram. you so much for talking about dead bodies and history with us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, for you Karen. Me. Yes. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs>